Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. May God add his blessing to the harsh reading that Matthew wrote here today. Amen. Before I get into the meat of this message, I think we ought to take a look at our prayer life, at prayer. Is prayer effective? Do you believe that prayer is effective in your life? Would you say that prayer is imperative in your life? Yes. Is prayer something that is answered? Is it answered fast enough? Or do you sometimes have thought, it's just never answered? I pray and pray, and I don't get any results. Those are the kind of things we need to look at before we get into this sermon. Is prayer mandatory? Yes. I would say, yes, it is mandatory of a believer. We need to pray early and often. We need to pray when we feel like not praying. We need to pray at times when it's inconvenient, when we're tired, when we're busy, so that we don't come up with these excuses to say, well, I, and we forget about praying. It happens, happens to the pastor, happens to everybody, but we have to get past the excuses and pray. Prayer is serious business. It may be the most serious thing you undertake before you start your day. It may be the most serious thing you do before you end your day. Prayer. So how does prayer look? Am I supposed to be somber? Am I supposed to be quiet? Am I supposed to be sad? Can I pray with my hands raised? Can I pray while I'm singing? Can I pray while I'm driving? Can I pray by shouting? Can I pray when I'm angry? Can I pray when I'm depressed? Can I pray when I'm elated? When is it that I cannot pray? Never. We always are to pray. And we are to pray sometimes out of enjoyment. Sometimes out of the ridiculous. We are to pray, as Paul says, at all times without ceasing. So be in constant communication with with your Lord. So let's analyze in your minds, don't raise your hands, but just analyze your prayer life and think about that while I give you these words over the next uh, few minutes. And think about this. Why is it if we are prayerful people to some degree or another, we're prayerful people, some more than others, some deeper than others, some more shallow than others. Either way, whatever our prayer life is, why is it that we Christians like to tell other people how to worship? If we are prayerful people, why do we feel like we should tell other people how they do it? And why are we threatened by the way other people do it? Why can't we just enjoy our worship and enjoy that other people are worshiping. But we have this, I feel like we have this thought, we Christians, you can interject yourself if it, you feel like it, have this feeling that we are the only ones that do it right. If everyone would just do it like me, if everyone would believe and act like me, we would not have the problems we have. We feel that way. If people would just pray, serve, behave, maybe even believe certain points just like me, oh, what a wonderful world it would be. But they don't. And so we have tables. And if you read the New Testament, it seems like there were a lot of people worshiping in a lot of different ways. Jesus didn't come and just say, we're going to worship in this way. Now, 
Did he address, did he finger point, did he accuse? Or did he take people and give them grace? Hmm. He's given this guy a lot of grace who didn't always do it on the straight and narrow. Sometimes we just get a bit arrogant in our... Uh, well, no, no, I'm not arrogant. I'm just better than you. <laughs> Sometimes that's how the Christian comes across. I mean, it's not that we're better. You know, we go to church every week. We're not just be- Well, yeah, I am. I'm just better than you. Because I spent time with God. Makes me better. How, how about this? Do we boast about our freedom? Americans do. Do we boast about our liberty? Well, I think we do as Americans. And we, we boast on, our, on, on those things, on our freedom and our liberty, based on our faith. You can come to this country and you can practice your faith in freedom and liberty. Well, if you're practicing the faith and liberty that's mine, you can do it free. But we're quick to impose rules and regulations on those that aren't just like me. Have you ever heard the following? Have you ever heard this? You don't need to raise your hand. You can just get red in the face. I don't lift my hands and worship and you shouldn't either. We serve the poor and give away lots of money and so should you. I don't let my kids see R-rated movies. You are a bad Christian if you do that. We don't dance. All Christians who do are sinning. You shouldn't listen to secular music, just Christian music. Or you shouldn't listen to Christian music with a certain beat, that's from the devil. If you don't homeschool, you're not godly. We don't drink alcohol, it's wrong for all Christians. Christians who smoke shouldn't be allowed in church. We don't use credit cards, if you do, you're not a good steward. You're not a stay-at-home mom? How can you call yourself a Christian mom? If you're not immersed, well then your baptism doesn't count. If you don't read this particular translation of the Bible, you're just not a serious Christian. We don't ordain women to ministry, and we don't fellowship with people who do. If you're not a five-point Calvinist, you're not a very sophisticated Christian. If you believe in the gift of tongues, you're a liberal. If you believe in any form of evolution, you're probably not a Christian. Christians who don't believe in the young earth theory of creation are worshiping gods of science. Now you all would probably say you're young earth theorists because that's the one that believes in Genesis and that the creation took place somewhere between six and 10,000 years ago. Christian musicians who cross over and do rock, pop, or country music have sold out to consumerism and have abandoned their faith. Ever heard any of those things? They're out there and they're said by Christians. Christians say those things. Non-Christians don't say those things. Christians say those things. I wonder if you'd approve my radio station. I don't know what radio stations you have on your, this is what's on mine. This is what I listen to. These are, these are already in my system I just punch the button and I listen to the Beatles uh, and Dave Matthews. I listen to 60s, 70s, and 80s. I listen to the 80s for my wife. Not a big 80s fan. My wife's a big 80s fan. I listen to the Spectrum classic albums. I listen to the Coffee House, Watercolors, which is jazz, classic symphonies when I'm in that mood. I listen to Big Ten Radio because I'm a Big Ten fan, Dan. Sorry, not an SEC fan or an ACC fan. The message is the Christian music I listen to. And then I listen, of course, to MLB, NHL, and NFL. And I do listen to Fox, CNN, and NPR. Because if you listen to just one of them, you're not a Christian. No, I'm just these. <laughs> you have to listen to all three because none of them will you tell you the whole truth. They tell you what they want you to hear. That's, that, those are my stations. I don't know if you all want to submit your stations. Maybe we ought to have a, a deal where every Sunday somebody stands up and submits their stations. That's what I listen to. So your pastor doesn't listen to Christian music 24-7. He listens to it sometimes. And I listen to it every time I'm going to do a message. I always get a little fired up by listening to Christian music. 
But during the day when I'm taking people to and fro, we listen to the Beatles or the 60s or one of those other stations. I mean, some people think that you can't be a Christian if you listen to Coldplay or Taylor Swift. I mean, who would listen? Or maybe Kanye West. Oh, you can't be a Christian and listen to him. So sometimes we impose these things. We will, we will actually let our tradition keep us from witnessing. And Jesus talked about that. He told the Pharisees that they were losing their faith for the sake of their tradition. We need to know that in the 21st century, that still happens. So you can see how judgmental and, and hypocritical this thinking is. Because sometimes Christians get into the business of legislating how other people should behave. Here's the lie. If it's wrong for me, it's wrong for everyone. If God requires me to do it, then he requires every Christian to do it. If we are not all completely uniform in our Christian beliefs and practices, then someone is out of line. If, we, if others aren't acting, worshiping, and believing exactly like I do, then they're not good Christians. In fact, they might not be Christians at all. That's the lie. And it's the lie that many Christians, many believers believe. Did Jesus set up a standard that we all were to be judged on? Did he have a standard? Oh, he did have a standard. What was that standard? To be judgmental? To be hypocritical? To actually impose our will on others? No. Oh, one word, love. That was the standard. That was the universal behavior that Jesus told the disciples and anybody that would listen to him, that is the standard. The standard isn't whether you're immersed, sprinkled, or doused, whether you're Methodist, Lutheran, <coughs> Presbyterian, non-denominational, Catholic. He didn't say any of those things. But unfortunately, we have replaced love for being judgmental and being legalist. And we've replaced grace with those words. In fact, we keep score. You know, I brought food to the food pantry. Bingo! Points for me. I came to movie night and prayer time this week. Twop! Bing! Points for me. I was here at church on Sunday. Points for me. And so we have this scoreboard that we think the more we do of those things, the more points we're building up, and when we get up there, we hopefully we'll have enough points to get the ball over the line to get in. <laughs> and it just doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. And for all those of you that do work in the church, please keep working. But it isn't your ticket to heaven. It doesn't do. So what is legalism? Because that is a word that is thrown out by a lot of non-believing, non-attending people that haven't found a faith or haven't chosen to be because we have shown our legalistic side to them and they don't want to be part of that. Legalism is the practice of establishing standards for spiritual performance. Or instead of God and expecting that you and others will do something that will adhere ourselves to him by, by our works. So how would you like our church body or our community to place you, your faith in legal terms, in, in something you had to adhere to? Is that the faith you want to be part of? Do we do that here at Sylvan Abbey? Do we have certain things you have to do here to be accepted, to be a Christian, to be a believer? If, if we do, if we hold each other accountable to, to legalistic things, then we're talking about works-oriented spirituality. Can you get into heaven by your work? For those of you that didn't answer, the answer is no. Paul tells us about that. Your works will not get you into heaven. What gets you into heaven? Faith through grace. God graces us. He actually woos us to be faithful to him. And as we are faithful through his grace, because we are sinners, we get an opportunity for heaven, not from our works. So it puts 
the responsibility for gauging someone's spiritual maturity if we are legalists on other people. Well, I think you were, I think you're going to be get into heaven because you're, you're working hard in the church. You're doing a lot of things for God. He's going to really like that. God is the one that actually makes that decision, not each of us as individuals. A legalist is someone who really majors in rule keeping. If you keep the rules. Remember the Pharisees, legalists. They knew all the rules. They knew exactly. Why didn't the disciples wash their hands before eating? They broke a rule. They're not going to make it into heaven not washing their hands. See, it reduces God to rules and regulations, to adhering to laws, and that's not, that's not what it's supposed to be. Many of us like rules because it's easy, it's convenient. I can see it in black and white. Let me adhere to these rules. Show me the rules. I'll play the game. People who love lists are usually legalists because you want to know exactly what you have to do and do it. A plus B equals C. But that, that kind of living sucks the life out of faith. If we are legalists, we will suck the life right out of our faith. Because there's no love in rule keeping. Somehow we think that God owes us a break if we can keep the rules. God will look well upon me if I can keep the rules. Show me the rules, I will follow the rules. So let's see if we recognize these examples. Legalists have trouble celebrating other Christians' successes. And if you have trouble celebrating other people's successes, it's hard to watch somebody prosper because nobody can be trying harder than me. Why wasn't I rewarded? Why were they rewarded? I deserved it. Because no one deserves God's favor more than me. I'm trying so hard. That's a legalist view. They're envious, and they can even be hateful towards others. How about they feel the need to defend themselves? Good legalists don't understand grace, so they feel like they always have to defend themselves. When they fail, they don't want to own up to it, they don't want to confess to it, they make excuses, they defend themselves because they don't want to admit that these best efforts that they're doing just aren't working. They feel entitled. Legalists believe God owes them a blessing. I mean, after all, I'm following his rule, rules he owes me. Keep the rules, do hard work, that merits special treatment from God. After all, he's lucky I'm on his team. It's what God can do for them more than what they want to do for God. Legalists don't understand that our faith is deeply rooted in love. So a legalist, it's not a relationship like father-son or father-daughter. It's more about employer-employee. It's more about commander and soldier. Those are legalists. The goal is, is for them, for God to present things to them, not for them to be in the presence of God. And it's hard for them to extend grace to others. If you go by the rules, they're standard, and so when someone breaks the rules, it's hard for them to extend grace because why would somebody break the rules? You're just not trying hard enough. Legalists live by, I can and you didn't. It's a legalist. And legalists typically struggle with secret sin. They are spiritually bankrupt, and it leads to a lot of emotional and spiritual pain. You find a lot of legalists that are struggling with alcoholism, work being a workaholic, prescription drug abuse, pornography. And the legalist seeks self-medication for the pain that is flowing out of them because they have a system that where their feelings are flawed. Well, the question would be, does any of this sound familiar? And, and the question is, do you have any legalist in you? And the real answer is, most all of us have a little bit of legalist in us. But, but the good news is, Jesus calls us, right? Remember, all those that are weary and are heavy burdened by our part of legalism that maybe we heard ourselves described as, that, that part of legalism, Jesus is there to give us rest. All those who of us, us, 
that are weary, struggling with that part, Jesus is calling us to rest. So I've, I've given you some scriptures that you can write down, or, or, but I'll go over them with you. Galatians says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened by the yoke of slavery, the yoke, yoke of being burdened. Matthew 7, do not judge or you'll be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Romans 2, you therefore have no excuse, you, will pass, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Romans 14, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. We have the Matthew scripture that I read about the plank in your eye while you're looking at the speck in your brother's eye. The good news is, the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the Christian believer, God doesn't condemn his children. God is not a condemning God. He praises us. He gives us grace. He loves us. He cares for us. And since he doesn't condemn us, why would we condemn others? Why would we condemn others who don't practice the way we do? Why would we condemn others who raise their hands when we don't think we should? Why do we condemn others that, that don't dance when we want to dance? But we have this condemning thought process. We should give Christians permission to be different. I am not. You are not the only Christ follower in the world. And you're not the most committed, neither am I. There are more committed Christians than me. And we're not loving Jesus the best. If you think you are the best Christian and you are loving Jesus the best, then your world is really, really small. got to remember that God has Christians all over the world, all over this beautiful world, and many of them, all of them are different than you. So what should we do? Keep our mouth shut and pray. Before we say something we regret, before we say something we shouldn't, we should pause, keep our mouth shut, and pray. If you have problem with somebody else's behavior, their actions, the way they worship, the way they act, the music they listen to, before you speak, pray to God about it. Remember, God is working on you, God is working on me, God is working on others. And, and we have a scripture for that. Being confident of this, he who began a great work and you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Who believes that when they were saved, that was it? I'm in. I'm saved. It's over. Salvation is completed when? When you're having dinner with Jesus in heaven. Salvation is not done when you get saved. You have got work to do. Sorry. Work to do. Practice confession. Go to God whenever it is you go to Him. Morning, noon, or night. Confess those things that you did. Confess those times you were a legalist. Confess, be honest, be brutally honest. Those things that are planks in your eye, maybe the specks in your eye, ask God to remove those. Getting rid of it will keep you from, from getting on somebody else's case. Keep your mouth shut and pray. Oh, did I say that already? Don't slander, gossip, or talk about other believers. Don't talk about them. Pray for them. Don't talk about our brothers and sisters in faith because they don't do it like we do. Pray for them. And pray that they're praying for you. And know the difference in the gospel according to Jesus Christ and the gospel according to insert your name. There's a gospel according to Chuck Smith. I laid it on my kids daily. It's not a very good gospel. It's not a very true gospel enough times. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the only gospel. It's the only true gospel. And it's the only gospel we ought to be witnessing on. If you're witnessing on the gospel according to insert your name, stop. Your gospel's not good. The gospel according to Jesus Christ is the only one. 
So to do that, we have to become biblically more literate. So come to Bible studies. Read the Bible on your own. Listen to all the, all the available stuff on the internet now. My goodness, there's some great stuff on the internet. There's some garbage too. Find the good stuff. Ask me, I can help you. And remember to keep your mouth shut and pray. So maybe it's time for we Christians to get off our high horses and stop trying to control everybody else's behavior because it's a heavy burden to carry. And I think God is quite capable enough, he's quite strong enough to be able to handle and manage all the worship styles that are out there that don't do it like us. Even the theological nuances that we don't agree with. I bet you God can handle that. I'm just going to throw in, I believe God can handle it. Probably doesn't even need my help. Probably can handle it without me. And so if you're exhausted by a legalistic lifestyle, or maybe you need to take on more grace, give yourself a break. Turn all of that over to God. Lay it at His feet. Because the kingdom of God's not going to fall apart because of those things that you were thinking about others. You can receive some grace from God and take joy in the fact that your name can be written in the book of the Lamb. So we need to pray for God's kingdom, that His will would be done in your life as often as possible and that heaven would be here with us. Pray for the same not just in your life, but the life of your family, the life of your fellow brothers and sisters. Remember, all those who are weary and are heavy burdened by whatever it is that's burdening you, give it to Jesus, and he will give you rest. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and loving God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your son who died for us. We're thankful for, thankful for the Holy Spirit who enables us to be guided. We choose, Lord, to not call on him enough. We call on the Holy Spirit now to just envelop this group of people that they would, when burdened, come to you, that they would confess those things to you that, they, that are not pleasing, and that they'd feel the grace of your love just encompass them. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn is number 593. Here I am. <laughs>